Brandon, is the feeling that it might cost more than 87000 to maintain the marina? And they had a, if they wanted to increase that routine maintenance charge, they would have to bring that before your honorable body for you to approve it. Now, as far as, um, I'll get to the gas overrings in one second, um, but I just want to address um, what this Common Council did. It is my understanding that um, that the implication is that because this Common Council accepted a response to an audit that that it uh, somehow changed the contract. Uh, I know for a fact that we've, we've filed many audits with this Common Council with many responses from the departments. And perhaps Mr. Gerstmann can help me, but I don't think that um, accepting a response to an audit can counts as uh, the Common Council approving, sorry, approving a change to a contract. The last, has there been any, I mean, I do not believe the Common Council uh, changed this contract. Perhaps somebody can address that. Um, Corporation Council, in the 09 meeting, Mr. Carney referred to it as well, um, that the Finance Committee accepted the change. Did that take place? Uh, Alan Gerstmann, Assistant Corporation Counsel. We have to review the exact record of what the council actually did. I couldn't answer that hypothetically. We didn't. We didn't adopt it. Yeah, we, 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 we don't. Respond. Yeah, we don't adopt a, a response. Nothing, it's an informational not a, item. It's an informational. No it's not a action. Yeah, right. it's received and filed. I believe right. So a received and filed of a document is not the same of changing and and a contract with the city with a vendor. So. Um, you know, you can file any kind of response you want just because this common council accepts it and receives and file it. Doesn't mean it's an action item. Doesn't mean it changes any contract. The contract says 10% of fuel sales, not 10 cents per gallon. So if they did not like that stipulation of the contract, you know, they've had many years to come to this common council to get proper approval. And so that proper approval was never given. And therefore, the money is still owed to the city. And, um, you know, I, I just was browsing through this. Um, and it says in the response that fuel inventory remains in the tanks as Brand Don does not empty the tanks at the end of each season. The inventory is rolled over to the next season. We maintain access to the tanks during off-season as we may purchase fuel at a lower rate should it be available to keep fuel sales competitive. That's contradictory towards... Um, a conversation that Mr. Wallace told uh, Kevin Kaufman as um, indicated by a memo in the file. And it says, Mr. Wallace stated that he stores as little inventory as possible over the winter and that the quantity stored does not change dramatically from year to year. So the response said something, one thing, and um, the conversation he had with Mr. Kaufman before this response was a different story. Um, the city auditor, Kevin Kaufman, would like to uh, address the overrings on the gas sales. On the overrings Kevin, on the before gas... before you do, I just, I just want to acknowledge the council. We've been joined earlier by council members Franzek, Rivera, uh, Smith, and Fontana. As stated in number 1A, errors and base sales of their response to our audit, they have an Exhibit A where it lists the actual overings and cash overage and short summary. In 2008, ship store 83 sheet, it says overings of $25,000. Yet on August 3rd, we only recorded $1,000 in sales at the ship store. So we did account for the overage. Additionally, it says on gas stock 81 sheet, $13,000. $755 in overrings. On 8-1, we had recorded $2,000 in, I'm sorry, $4,000 in fuel sales. Again, it doesn't add up. There's no way that can be. Thank you for the opportunity to respond. Alan, at, at any point, did the council act on changing the contract from ten that you're aware of from ten percent to ten cents a gallon. 
Uh, I'm not aware that there was a uh, an action by the council approving an amendment to the contract. However, I would state that when the council received the response without a surcharge, without any notice that it was seeking any of the monies which, it, which by the audit it would have been due, it was sending a clear message to Brandon that they were accepting and adapting the 10 cents a gallon. Why would you accept our response in 2009 and not, and not surcharge them? If you still thought that you were entitled to the 10%, then why would there not have been a surcharge? What you're attempting to do now is surcharge. You're attempting to go back to the contract and say, you owe us X number of dollars based on 10% of sale. And I understand that. But the difference now is, if, if the Finance Committee wasn't going to move forward and, and adopt the 10 cents a gallon in 2009, why wasn't there a surcharge? I just would like to ask, does the council ever not accept a response to an audit? Is it, I'm, it, I've, been, you know, I've only been here two years, but generally there's, you know, all the audits that we've submitted to the council, there's always a response from the department those responses are always accepted. I don't believe that just receiving and filing a response in any way endorses the response uh, that was given to any particular audit. I believe it's just filed. And I mean, I don't think that in this, t in this time I've, I've been in with the controller's office that they've ever rejected a response to an audit. I don't think that's common practice, is it? It, it seems to be the issue is we accepted both the audit and response and I believe they were received and filed at the end of that meeting. And there was no follow-up by... Right. And our, our audit at no. the time said that it's 10%. Their response said it isn't. You accept it both. It doesn't really endorse either side. So. It seems as though there was no follow-up by either possibly the departments or the council. So, Council Member Rivera. Mr. Chairman, um, we're, I'm sitting here listening to back and forth, and I just want a clear response from the Corporation Council on this matter. I mean, they're our attorneys. They advise us. Um, they negotiate these contracts. Uh, they know the procedures and the laws. So certainly, I, Mr. Tim Ball is here, and, and, Mr., and we're going back and forth. And certainly, I would like a response from our law department who represent this council and the administration, corporation council in the city of Buffalo, to give us a clear response as to this matter. Alan Gerstman, assistant corporation council. And essentially, you're asking, as far as the audit, when the when something is filed with the council and referred to committee, the committee receives a paper. They may determine to uh, take no action and receive and file. They may maintain it on the table for further discussion or action and take some further action resulting in a resolution which would be an act of the council. In this case, I believe that the uh, former audit, that the controller's audit was, report was received. It was filed with the council, referred to committee. Responses were heard to it, and then all of the matters were received and filed. So the council took no further action. Uh, they could have taken other actions but at, at this point, it's, uh, as has been stated, it is, the, it is frequent that this council receives audit reports, responses to reports, and uh, does not deem it necessary to take further action and receives and files all of the, the material because they're informational. Uh, the act of receiving audit 
materials doesn't constitute an act of the council. It's so pretty by, clear. Excuse me. Sorry. So then by not, by receiving it, uh, it's something we normally do. Uh, no other action was taken with regards to it. We receive the response. No action was taken by the council other than just to receive it. Then, even though it was discussed in meeting, no action was taken. It does not change. I, I'm just trying to understand. So uh, it does not change or amend the contract just because we received the response. Well, the con yes, that's correct. Okay. So basically, the, the contract stands. Am I correct? Until amended. Until amended. There was no amendments to the contract that you're aware of? No, that's correct. OK, so the contract stands. Now, the question then at Brandon is they saying that it came before the council, and because it was discussed before the council, um, and because there was no surcharge on behalf, they're saying because there was no surcharge on behalf of the city, that the assumption is that the council agreed um, to changing uh, the ten per or the ten uh, ten percent to ten cents a gallon. Um, but there's nothing. I mean, I understand uh, where perhaps you, you 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 probably would argue that. Um, but this council did not at any point amend or change the contract. And even though it was discussed and received by this council, it does create a problem. Um, so I just want a clarification from the Corporation Council because we're going back and forth. And it's, it's good that we know that we can discuss things. It doesn't, just because we discuss it, we receive it, doesn't mean that the contract is changed or amended. Um, there is a procedure for doing that, and at some point, contract would be brought to the council where the council would approve it, and that uh, then has some weight. So um, I just want a clarification from the corporation council. Thank you. Th thank you. Council President Fontaine. No such thing as a tacit approval from this council, even based upon our approval of something. We have to take an action. It's either approval, adoption. And if it has to do with finances, it would be an approval of this body of a, an item that's actually filed by the Commissioner of Public Works. And it has to actually be filed by the Commissioner. So that's the, the issue here. Now, my question for the Comptroller's Office is, if this was discussed on the floor of the Council, and there's an issue of uh, judicial responsibility of the Comptroller's Office to follow up, what follow-up was taken by the Comptroller's Office at that time? It looks like in 05, after it was discussed on the floor of the Council, that an item was awry in the contract. Which action, what actions did the Comptroller's Office take at that point? I, um, this current Comptroller was elected and took office in 2012. Right. Um, personally, I was not here uh, at the issuance of the previous audit. Uh, City Auditor Kevin Kaufman was not here. Right. The, the two field auditors, Sherelle and Carlos, were not here at the time. We represent a new team in the controller's office. The, the, the prior controller, Honorable Andy Sanfilippo, and the prior city auditor, Daryl McPherson, they would be the ones to answer that question. Certainly, our office can't take responsibility for a failure to follow up on their part. Um, but as long as Mark Schroeder is controller, we're going to follow up on every recommendation we made. We sent an invoice for three hundred and forty-three thousand by f to follow up on what we believe is owed to the city. Right. And I I'd like just to say that every year, every time that an audit passes, a year later we revisit it and follow up on those recommendations. So I'm sorry I can't speak to the previous audits, but this controller's office always follows up on its audits and has done so and will continue to do so. Based on that point, are there any records from? past controllers, that's essentially where I was going with this question. Is there any controllers report from that period in a filing cabinet in the office somewhere saying that we did revisit this a year later, we sent a letter instructing the company that they still were underpaying the city of Buffalo? Is there anything in the controller's office that states that? I'm not aware of anything uh, like that, but, you know, I, 
I don't know if it might be on Mr. McPherson's or Mr. Sampolo's computer, which we don't have access to those records. Right. So, I mean, there could be, there could have been something. We just have no way to access it. There was nothing we found in our file. All right. Well, the, the issue here is this. It came before the body. It was discussed before the body. The controller's office, as they do now, is charged to follow up with these cases. And in this situation, it doesn't seem that we have a record of follow-up at this point. So it's up to the company, though, to get an item filed with the council. They can't take the controller's word. This can't be a uh, handshake deal. It can't be a situation where the controller says, I got it covered for you. The company has to base their finances and their payments, and this should have been caught in their own internal audits, actually, with the contract. Uh, based on an item filed with the council, that item should be amended to the contract, and then the new rate should be paid at that point. That's the process. That process was not followed. Therefore, the contract is still valid. We're still owed the, the funds that are um, at the 10%. Now, look, at, at a dollar a gallon, which I was paying when I first started driving, a little less than that, that would be 10 cents a gallon. At $2 a gallon, which was probably even low at the time of this contract, we would have been at 20 cents. $3 a gallon would have been at 30 cents. This body would have definitely looked at a 20 cent reduction price um, 20 cents per gallon reduction in price, which seemed excessive at the time. That would have been $0.20 cents lost on every gallon of gas pumped. So the numbers, in my opinion, don't add up. That's a huge discount, $0.20. Cents. If gas went from 3 to 4 or 4 to 5, which I think the gas at the marina might be closer to 5 than it is to 4 because of the, um, the water location, and our, our able uh, attorney here mentioned that there was a $0.29 cent deduction in the price, which would show me that it's at about $5, gall $5 a gallon. At five dollars a gallon, it would have been fifty cents. That's quite high. So, an item filed with this council could have seen um, some debate on the floor of the council. But at um, three dollars and being at thirty cents down to ten, that's an awful big jump. And from fifty cents down to ten, it's an even bigger jump. So, those are some concerns that the council would have uh, debated had the item been filed with the council. We would not debate that situation in an audit response to the council in some cases, because we don't have the original agreement with us uh, to match up the, the numbers. And the follow-up here is really what I'm interested in to see how the controller's office did follow up, if any follow-up was made by the controller's office to make the change. But no tacit approvals here had to be approved by the council. And obviously, at this point, we don't see any kind of documentation that we did approve this. Therefore, the contract is, is still valid. Any other questions? Yeah. Councilmember Smith. Um, doing 10% a gallon versus 10 cents a gallon, would, would the company be able to be competitive for that? Absolutely not. That was the exact discussion going back to 2004, 2005, 2006, and again in 2009. As I stated, and if, if, you, if you just look at Exhibit F, To remain competitive, if we were to pay uh, 10 cents, a, or I'm sorry, 10 percent, we would be making um, about two cents a gallon. So if we sold the gas at a competitive price, paying the city 10 percent, our profit would be about two cents a gallon, which the comptroller's office in their own notes have said profit range should be between 15 and 20 cents a gallon. We couldn't even pay the minimum wage to pump the gas at that cost, let alone the insurance, the maintenance. And, and remember that at, at Brandon's own expense, we installed all new digital uh, uh, pumps. I strike the facility expense, I apologize. So we, we're, we simply can't. And how does that reflect on the city? If we're selling gas at 38 cents more than everyone else, our gas sales will go down to about 15 to 20 percent of what they are now. So ultimately, the revenue to both Brandon and the city would be affected dramatically. Could any company, like, say you, a new company comes in, could they match, give 10 percent to the city? It's impossible. It, it's mathematical. It doesn't matter who's running it. In fact, I, my guess would be that the new company coming in would be subject to everyone paying the, minimum, the, uh, the living wage. And their expenses would be even higher than ours are now. We're paying about 60% voluntarily uh, living wage. So there, there's, there, it, it simply could not happen 
And that's what happened when they signed the original contract and lease in 2001. As, as President Fontana noted, the cost of gas had not escalated at that point. It has escalated significantly from 2005 to today. And to be competitive, and, and again, I remind this, we're not talking about pumping 20 gallons into a car. These are people who are going to price gasoline because they're pumping, on average, between 100 and 125 gallons. So it's a significant change if you're talking about somewhere between 39 and $50 per fill-up in so, savings. Then I guess, I guess where we're pinpointing this, and I think the council president did a good job of pretty much pinpointing it, is pretty much saying that there was a contract that was pretty much uh, unlivable with, with Brandon and the city. There was a contract that became, uh, um, as I said in my response and as we say in our response, it's a long-term contract. It's, it's a, a total of 14 years that as you entered and moved through the 14 years, it was clearly recognized between Brandon, um, uh, uh, then Commissioner Giambra, uh, and, uh, and the, even the Finance Committee in 2007, 2009, that it could not be competitive and maintain the 10%. That the breakdown is exactly as uh, um, Councilman Scanlon stated. If you go back and listen to the 2009 discussion, upon leaving that chambers, it was assumed that all parties were going to sit down and renegotiate that portion of this lease, along with the portion of the lease, which is sections 5E and F, I believe, uh, 5E and J, which talk about the maintenance of it. And just to respond quickly to Mr. Curry, uh, if you look at our letter dated March 8, 2004, we're very clear to then uh, Commissioner Jambra that the $87,000 is for the gardens and lawns only. That we're, we never agreed to take on the maintenance of the entire marina for $87,000. All right. No. <laughs> Going back to where we were going with this, so it became deemed that this 10% per gallon was, was, was not possible for, for the company and not good for the city. And so a conversation must have been had with then Commissioner Giambra to say, yo, we just can't do this. And then the agreement was made, um, which came in front of the council in the audit. It was brought up in the 2007 audit. It's a 2007 audit that was right. discussed and responded right. in 2009. And so they dis we discussed it in 2007, saying this just can't work. And in and, and the, the audit reports, it was, they said that in the report. They officially said that. And so from that meeting, there was no change in the contract for, what are we talking about, seven years now? Six, seven years? Uh, moving from 2007 forward forward into the current audit and so Correct. nobody just never <clears throat> took care of it. Right. Precisely. It right. was never it was never addressed. It was never addressed by, by any by anyone. By anyone. So however, you know, Councilman, please remember each year we filed our uh, our uh, our audit, each year we filed all of our all of our sales and accounted at ten cents per gallon. Each year we accounted relying on that to our detriment, perhaps. Okay. So then this was more or less something that wasn't taken care of, some business that wasn't tended to a new contract or an amendment to the current contract wasn't drawn up instead of some type of criminal activity. This is just some, uh, some business that wasn't tended to. Well, first of all, there's, as I said before, there's absolutely nothing criminal about this. This is a dispute between a landlord and a tenant. This is a dispute as to uh, uh, how much is owed under a contract. Right. There's nothing even remotely criminal about this. But you know, as we sent, uh, if you looking at Exhibit D, back then we sent a notice to the commissioner, uh, Joe Jambra, and, and uh, talked about the, uh, the need to change 10% to 10 cents, uh, that it would appear that this was discussed at, um, at the council level um, and referred to the finance committee. 
although again I agree with with Councilman Fontana that that the discussion that this body had and the referral in and of itself does not create um, uh, an amendment or a formal amendment to the contract it, it, uh, it, it certainly there. doesn't mean that that we may be liable as as we right. we were led down the the, the path that we that there was a, a change, and I did have a conversation with the uh, then uh, control uh, strike that then commissioner uh, Giambra uh, recently, and his 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 recollection to me was that that it, that it was addressed. That he said, you know, quite frankly, said to me, Mark, I thought we did address it. I thought it was put before the council, but there's obviously no notes that we know of right now that would indicate that. Um, so right now, it's pretty much a landlord-tenant dispute over a, a, over business that just wasn't wrapped up. What I mean, we have is exactly, Councilman. We have a we have a lengthy discussion in 2009, where two major areas were discussed. One was the maintenance, ongoing maintenance, wherein again they discussed the maintenance done in 2008 and the maintenance done in 2009, and the fuel costs. And during that discussion, it even goes back to 2005 and six, where it was discussed that it was back then that it was realized that it was that it just was not economically feasible to pay the 10 percent. So I think Councilman Smith is 100 percent correct. This is uh, um, this is an oversight that. No one leaving the chambers in July of 2009 took further action. Uh, and perhaps it should have been done, and there should have been a meeting between the Commissioner of Public Works, the, the, the Corporation Council, Brandon, Brandon's attorneys. And I would also throw in uh, the Harbor Master, as uh, uh, that entity has from time to time requested uh, maintenance time. And so I guess my question is then with the Corporation Council, if we have a contract that's supposed to be followed, but we accept a different payment structure to fulfill the needs of that contract and let it go on for six, seven, eight years, does that invalidate the contract? Or does do we now just by, by act, Institute another contract. I mean, I think I think that's probably where this whole thing is going to go. The uh, with the, the question of public contracts is quite clear that a contract can only be amended or altered by an affirmative act of the council. That's how uh, we okay. don't have oral agreements. We don't have. Uh, it's just the nature of a public contract that the written agreement is the agreement and it requires an affirmative act of the council to change things. Right. And, then, and I understand that 100%. But, like, say, if I have a, a lease agreement with somebody and I, they rent an um, apartment from me and the rent is $800, but for six, seven, eight years, I allowed them to pay me $250 and don't say anything about it, and then after so much time has accumulated, then now I want to reinforce the original agreement. What's the legality with that? I think that's the question of this whole thing right now. The, the written contract remains binding until changed. If it, over a period of time, it's a, there's a statute of limitations beyond which you cannot go back. You can't go back. Uh, I believe it's a six-year statute of limitations. You can't go back uh, to sue for more than six years ago, but uh, a failure to exercise your right isn't lost because you have not acted until the, the law says, well, it's over. You lose everything from more than six years ago, but your more recent claims are still valid. That landlord would be within his rights to continue to enforce the terms of his lease, even though he hadn't enforced it. Uh, such as the tenant said, I'll pay you, you know, I'll get around to paying you, but I can only pay this much. Uh, there comes a time 
that he only goes so far. It hasn't changed the contract only because he has forborne enforcement of the contract. So it doesn't change the term unless you actually make a formal change in the term. Right. Okay. I, th I think that's the, the question. Councilmember Russell. Um, I have two questions. First of all, is it my understanding that before